Welcome back to World War II TV, folks, and the final part of our Naval Battles Week. And this show came about rather suddenly, really, because I was supposed to be, in fact, I was supposed to be in the UK now, but I ended up not going because of, well, my parents got COVID. Uh, they're getting better. But anyway, let's move on from that. So, uh, Julio, who is now on his fourth appearance, I think, or maybe fifth on World War II TV, has stepped in to talk about a battle. Well, in fact, two battles, a first half and a second half that took place uh, 1941 and 1942 in the Mediterranean. If you are new to the channel, please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like the videos you are watching and share what we're doing on social media and maybe consider becoming a patron or YouTube member. And the news since last his last appearance, Julio now has his own World War II channel. Uh, the, the, the link to it is in the description below. There's some stuff in Italian, some stuff in English. His main videos are in both languages. So there's some more interesting uh, information out there about the Italian side and story in World War II. So go and subscribe to his channel for some more content. But right now, I'm going to bring him, him in. And um, good afternoon. How are you doing today? Well, yeah, I'm good. Uh, glad good. to be back. Yeah, so... Thank you for stepping into the breach and putting this together uh, reasonably quickly. And it came up, these two battles, it came up in the big discussion with Drac and Alexander, whenever that was, over a year ago now, which is very yeah. popular. And, you know, we don't need to go over this, the, the, main, the main theme so much about how under-talked under about the Italian Navy is, but it, it is the under-talked about. And, you know, we can, we can, obviously it'll come up in the conversation, but, you know, you are, we've talked about this before, you are, you are, you're one of those pioneers of making sure us English language speaking history buffs are getting a better and more up to date understanding of the Italian story in World War II. So on behalf of all our viewers, thank you very much for the work you do to bring this history to us because it's important. Yeah, thank you for the appreciation. Actually, yeah, the, there have been historians who have tried to, to speak in English about this, but uh, you know, Sometimes historians tend to talk to each other, only talk to each other, and so the general public, uh, also YouTube, needs uh, somebody from different countries that creates uh, content in English, and that's something I'm trying to do with uh, my YouTube channel. So if you're yeah. interested in the Italian Navy, yeah, the, that's the place to go. Yeah, and as we've always said, you know, we're, we're people of my age from my country and Americans and Can Canadians too, a lot of our understanding is filtered through the way that our histories were given to us when we were younger by British authors, American authors, telling things the British and American way. And some of the cliches and, and tropes about Italian forces and German forces still endure. They still are being repeated in, in, in quite mainstream books and on YouTube channels and Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. and you must roll your eyes five or six times a week at things you read about, oh, here we go again about yeah, these exactly. situations of these stories. So anyway, let's get back to the, uh, the, the what we're talking about. And um, so the second part of this battle was occurring 80 years ago, pretty much this week. Yeah, ne next, next week. Next week. <laughs> next week. So that's uh, quite uh, accidental, but yeah. So uh, when you read about uh, the Mediterranean campaign and especially the, the naval side, uh, in, the names that you more often more often hear about are you know the ride at taranto the battle of matapan the, the alexandra raid and so on and uh, these two battles uh, the first and the second battle of Sirte, are not uh, I, I bet they are not on the top list of people when they think about mediterranean naval battles and but these battles are not relevant for the tactical uh, outcome. Uh, we will see. We will see in the show, but they are very important for the strategic context of the, of the Mediterranean campaign. Uh, so, some context. Uh, we, we, of course, we will see the first battle, which take which took place uh, between the seventeenth and the nineteenth of December, nineteen forty-one, and. Uh, what well, what was the situation back then? So the in North Africa, uh, Rommel was facing the was facing Operation Crusader, so the Allied uh, offensive uh, against the Axis positions, which the, had the strategic goal of um, uh, releasing Tobruk, so in liberating the Tobruk, uh, the Australian garrison uh, in Tobruk, and also destroyed most of the Axis tanks in the in the, in the region and 
eventually uh, overrun Cyrenaica and Tripolitania. Mm, in December, the, the Axis had already retreated from the, the area uh, east of Tobruk, and they were already mm, on the way to Benghazi, so the, let's say the western part of Cyrenaica. Uh, in November, the access supply flow was um, in a dire situation. So we've talked about the fact that, uh, in general, the Italian Navy was uh, delivering the supplies. We could argue that there were not, never enough supplies shipped to North Africa, but in general, the, the rate of supplies uh, was was high. I mean, the Italian Navy managed, if we take the uh, general data, they delivered 85% uh, of supplies and 91% of the personnel. So overall, the, the numbers are fine, but as we will see in a moment, the monthly deliveries dif dif differ a bit. So there are more discussions we have to, to make on this. And this supply crisis uh, that was harder in October and November and early December was especially, uh, the reason was that uh, the, the British uh, increased their uh, offensive efforts against the uh, Axis supply lines because of the imminent uh, Operation Crusader. So they wanted to make sure that Rommel didn't receive the, the tanks and the most, most importantly the fuel. And, uh, and then the, um, the Royal Navy deployed a small force uh, of light cruisers and destroyers in Malta. It was Force K and then also the, the Force B who uh, stationed in Malta. And this caused uh, a serious headache to the, to the Italian Navy because they were, the British were able to fight and conduct operations at night. The Italians were not good at it because of some uh, technological uh, problems. For instance, uh, the Italians didn't, didn't have enough uh, or didn't have at all night optics for the uh, range finders, the binoculars and so on. And they also didn't have the training. They never trained consistently on, on that. And uh, also because in wartime, they could not train on that because of the fuel shortages. So the very complex situation. So this, this small force of destroyers and cruisers basically put uh, a threat to all the, the convoys uh, crossing, crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Because for slow merchant ships to cross the, the Mediterranean from Italy to the Libyan ports, it, it takes more than 24 hours. So eventually you will have to navigate at night. So eventually the force K can come and uh, strike you down. Um, then one, let's say the only uh, point in, uh, uh, in favor of the Axis in this situation that in November and December 1941, the, the Royal Navy has no more capital ships uh, available in the Mediterranean. I mean, uh, the Ark Royal, the aircraft carrier, aircraft carrier Ark Royal, and the HMS Baron had been sunk by German U-boats. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth and the Valiant, uh, the two battleships uh, in Alexander, will be sunk in harbor by the Italians uh, during the Alexander Raid, but this will be after the first Sirte. Well, I'm not considering them now because they were eventually short of destroyers, so they, they couldn't send them at sea because there were not enough destroyers to escort them. So this was the, the, the context. So the Axis uh, for land forces in retreat in Cyrenaica, uh, supply crisis in, um, uh, for, for Rommel and for his land forces. So the Italians, uh, the Italian, especially the Italian Navy, had to do something because uh, there was a tragic uh, loss at sea in, the, in, in December where the Italians lost an entire convoy. Uh, like six ships, six, six merchant ships, and a lot of fuel was lost. And this uh, put uh, the, um, the Italian Navy and the Italian High Command on a high pressure because it seemed that they were powerless to uh, facing the Force K. And so since they could not fight at night, they could uh, 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 not uh, fight this, uh, this tiny uh, force, light forces equipped with radar at night, they decided to, to do something, to try something different. And uh, I'll just show uh, this, sorry. Uh, as you can see, the, these are the, the supply routes uh, 
from between Italy and Libya. So they decided to organize a large convoy as they have never done before, because usually the, the, the convoys uh, organized by the Italian Navy were small convoys, like one or two merchant ships escorted by a few destroyers and torpedo boats. This because of the capacity of the Libyan ports. Um, so a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, infrastructural and strategic problem on this side. Uh, they decided in December to do the only thing they could do. So deploy the the maximum escort to the to this very important convoy that uh, uh, Rommel desperately needed. And so they decided to deploy basically the, the entirety of the uh, battleship forces uh, available back then. Uh, one step back, I wanted to show this. Uh, this graph shows the monthly uh, rate, uh, not, sorry, the, the numbers of the monthly shipments uh, to the to the forces in in Libya. So the blue the blue line is the blue area is the 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 supplies sent, and the orange uh, area is the supplies received actually received. And you see that it's it press it, it it goes fine until let's say July. So the losses are let's say sustainable, let's say. But then already from August uh, the thing things start to deteriorate, and then September October are harsher. And then you see the the, the drop in November. Um, so you see also a decline in the blue area because the fact that the fourth K fourth K was deployed in Malta, uh, they also blocked. Uh, they stopped the, the the convoy flow. So the 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 convoy schedule. Some of the convoy scheduled for November were cancelled or delayed. So. This is, uh, let's say, the, the graph, the, the crisis I mentioned to you before, it's depicted perfectly in this graph. Yeah. And so back to the to the to the Italian operation. So in the, in December they decide to uh, send this convoy of uh, six. Uh, I don't remember five or six merchant ships escorted by uh, four battleships and a um, bunch of uh, cruisers, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers. So the Admiral Iacchino departed uh, with uh, his flagship uh, Littorio, accompanied by the battleships uh, Giulio Cesare, Duilio, and Andrea Doria. Actually, one, one battleship, the Duilio, was close to the, to the convoy, while the other three were, um, were composed, like, let's say, the indirect escort. So usually in these operations, you have the merchant ships sailing together with the escort, the close escort, and then West or East, you have the indirect escort, which provides uh, support in case enemy ships um, approach from the East or from the, from the West. So I put here some images of the ships involved. Here you see the, the battleship Littorio in the foreground and Andrea Doria, while at sea together. The battleship Giulio Cesare. This is one of the old uh, um, Italian dreadnoughts that were rebuilt during the interwar years, and by that time they were considered uh, outdated. But nevertheless, they decided to deploy them uh, in this operation because they were deemed sufficient to deal with light cruises and uh, destroyers. So they set sail. Um, on the 16th of December, this this massive uh, formation, uh, com and the convoy was meant to split at some point, and one ship, the Ankara, uh, which was actually a German ship that was trapped in the Mediterranean when the World War II broke out, and remaining in Italian ports. This ship was meant to uh, reach Benghazi at some point, and then the rest of the convoy was meant to reach Tripoli. Uh, in parallel, the the British uh, had organized their own uh, resupply operation. Of course, the destination was Malta. Uh, this convo, this operation was meant to bring this uh, ship that you see up uh, up on the left, the Breconshire. The Breconshire was a, a merchant ship that carried uh, um, several thousand tons of fuel. Uh, this fuel was needed by the Force K and Force B in Malta to conduct their operations and pose a threat to the to the Italian convoy. So this convoy uh, had to bring the fuel to Force K and Force B and keep them active. 
And it, it's interesting why these two operations were organized and put in motion at the very same time. And the first battle of Sirte, uh, as most of the naval clashes in the Mediterranean campaign, is the result of um, convoy escort operations or um, actions aimed at uh, disrupting the enemy uh, supply convoys. Just, just one question. Yeah, is it just complete coincidence that these convoys were were happening at the same time, or is there any kind of intelligence as either, either side is using about a kind of an optimum time within a week or a month to do these things? Is there is always just a complete coincidence? Uh, I would, I, mm, I would say it's a complete coincidence. More, more, mm, more a complete coincidence because the, the Italians had tried another to organize another convoy one week before, but it was delayed because um, uh, some ships were torpedoed in the, in the uh, near Messina, so the, the the channel between Sicily and Calabria. So this operation was cancelled, and then they decided to to organize this one in uh, in the second the half of December. The um, the British are not entirely knowledgeable on, on the the British side, so how they conceive this operation, I'm, I'm, I guess that since the the Force K and Force B were kind quite active in the in this period, they needed uh, supplies, so it's more a coincidence that uh, these two forces engaged uh, and uh, met each other at sea. Okay, and it, it's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but of course, the, at some point, they uh, when they were at sea, they they. They became aware that the, the other the, the opponent was uh, at sea. Actually, the the Italians had some uh, concerns because they the air reconnaissance um, made an uh, made a mistake in uh, reporting the consistency of the British forces. For instance, the they identified the Breconshire as a battleship. I mean, this now it seems ridiculous, but. Uh, you have to you put put yourself in the situation. You are flying a uh, thousand meters high in the sky. You you spot this naval formation. You don't have a one one hundred percent zoom on it, so you see this uh, the silhouettes in the distance. The the Breconshire had a, a camouflage scheme, so these things happen very often in the uh, in naval operations. So they 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 reported that one battleship was uh, at sea. And actually, this was believed to be uh, realistic because the, the Italians and the German didn't know, didn't have the confirmation that the Baram was sunk back in November. And then other reconnaissance flights had reported the uh, Queen Elizabeth and the Valiant uh, still uh, in port in Alexandria. So it was plausible that the, the Baram, is, in this case, uh, was at sea uh, since there was no confirmation of, the, of its sinking. Okay. Uh, so Admiral Aquino was a bit worried about this, but Again, he had four battleships, so they, they pushed forward and they um, continued the navigation. So they eventually they uh, they meet in this um, area, and you see that it's basically the northern part of the the sea area that is called the Gulf of Sirte. So that's uh, that's why uh, it's called the first Battle of Sirte. So they uh, they spot each other first. Um, by using the seaplanes, uh, in the case of the of the Italians, and uh, I think the the British um, used um, airplanes based in Malta, who spotted the Italians and then reported the the position to the to the British. So the the British are aware that there are there are battleships in Italian battleships in the air. So there are they, they have there are four battleships, and so the. The, the odds are not uh, uh, entirely in their favor, but then, nevertheless, the um, the two formations encounter at sea, and uh, here's the, the the depiction of the action. The action in itself is, uh, uh, as I told you, it lasted like ten minutes. It uh, they met in late afternoon. Uh, Admiral Aquino ordered the the convoy to reverse course towards north just to be to be to be safe, and then he 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 sailed in the direction of the British formation. There was um, 
a gun ex, uh, gunner exchange between the two formations. Actually, the, the, the British came forward in order to uh, protect the Breconshire uh, to also avoid that the Italians could spot the Breconshire and so allow the, the safe passage of this, uh, of this important ship. Actually, the, the British fired, but they were out of um, out of range because they only had uh, 152, 133 millimeter guns. While the Italians fired with the, the heavy artillery of the battleship, but still at very very la, um, long distances. The they fired at be distances between uh, 22 and 25,000 meters for the cruisers, which it's a considerable uh, distance, so you're, you don't expect to hit something at these uh, distances. And uh, the Littorio and the other battleship, they fired at distances between 29 and 32,000 uh, meters. So you, 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 you don't get a hit at these distances. But uh, night was approaching, the, the British made small screens, they changed, uh, they made ev evasive maneuvers. And then with night falling, the, the Italians, uh, Disengage. I mean, both formations disengaged and uh, sailed towards their respective convoys. And then, long story short, the uh, the Italian convoy then uh, reversed again its course, and then they uh, approached uh, the Libyan coast. And the um, the British did the same. They um, avoid. They basically passed. Uh, we moved to to this other graph. Basically, the the, um, the British cruisers reunited with the Breconshire and they passed uh, south of the original uh, route of the Italians and they reached Malta. The Italians uh, um, circulated uh, above and then went down back, back down to the to the to their destination. So they 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 crossed uh, the uh, the Gulf of Sirte when the British were already near Malta. And do do each side have effectively the same rules of engagement because as you said at the beginning it's all about getting supplies at this point they don't really want to engage each other they don't yeah not not the purpose so did, did, at this point of the war in 41 uh is it the, the convoy commander who makes any decision about what to do if they see enemy do, you know is the first course to to try and alter your course and avoid contact or do you move towards or is it or does it vary from convoy to convoy and time and time and place uh, so I would say the, the British commanders at sea had way more autonomy than the, right. uh, the Italian ones. Uh, Iacchino was, uh, knew, knew that this combo had to be uh, delivered. Right. Uh, it had to reach the Libyan coast. But at some, uh, at some point uh, uh, before the, the clash, he received a communication from the, the Italian Navy High Command telling that in case he could consider the... Um, the option of disengaging the convoy and sail back to Taranto. But this was not, uh, let's say, uh, an absolute order, let's say. Right. In, in this situation, he, we could say that he had some autonomy, but he also knew that this convoy had to reach uh, Tripoli and Benghazi at, at all costs. And that's also why they risk it. They risk their entire bat battlefield force, which is something that, in principle, it doesn't make any sense because you are consuming a lot of uh, fuel, a lot of NAFTA in doing this operation. NAFTA that the Italians don't have or have in limited, in limited uh, amounts. And uh, But that that was the only thing they could realistically do <laughs> to, to push this convoy through uh, in, in, in this situation that we have described. Uh, the epilogue is uh, it's quite uh, interesting. Uh, the, the Italian convoy uh, and let's say get gets closer to the um, to the Libyan coast. The, uh, as I mentioned, the Ankara goes to to Benghazi. The um, and the rest approaches Tripoli. What happens that is uh, as here uh, I put a picture of the Breconshire entering the the Grand Harbor in Malta. Actually, there is a very important, uh, let's say, aftermath of this uh, of this operation. The um, Force K and part of Force B, after um, returning to Malta with the Breconshire, they refueled and then they uh, they knew that the Italian convoy was directed uh, at Tripoli, 
and they also knew that uh, the battleship escort would have not uh, uh, come closer to the Libyan shores because they they had to return home at, at some point and the convoy escort was only uh, fell only on the destroyers. Um, there was also a light cruiser division uh, with the convoy, but I'm not sure if the, the, the British were aware of this presence. So they basically dispatched the Force K to hunt down the, the Italian convoy. And then like 32 kilometers uh, off the coast of Tripoli, they ran into uh, a minefield that was laid down in, in summer. And they lose one cruiser, one destroyer, they are sunk. And another cruiser and another destroyer are heavily damaged, and they barely managed to to return to to Malta. So the, there is this uh, very uh, negative outcome uh, for the for the Royal Navy in this situation because they af after these losses, the Force K is um, is, no, is no more active. So they are they are no more. Uh, um, a substantial threat. The Italians don't realize this uh, immediately. They, they will realize it uh, after some weeks. Uh, and then you have, uh, on the 19th of December, uh, you have the Alexandra raid, where the Queen Elizabeth and the Valiant are sunk. So 1941 for the, for the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean ends in a very dramatic way because they have lost all the capital ships. They, are, they have a lot of destroyers and cruiser uh, damage. The, the Force K is no more. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a very dangerous situation. And on the Axis perspective, from the Axis perspective, things Im improve because this important convoy uh, reaches Libya. Uh, they come, the supplies uh, and the, the tanks um, delivered are instrumental for Rommel to launch his... Uh, counter-attack in January and February, because we know that Crusader man Operation Crusader manages to push the Axis forces back to the, the border between Cyrenaic and Tripolitania. But then Rommel is very uh, um, quick in launching a counter-attack that already in February brings him uh, not far from Tobruk. Uh, so basically countering or countering the, the results achieved by... Um, Operation Crusader. And he manages to do so because of the successful of this operation. And also uh, on the success of this operation, the Italians launch another resupply operation, deploying the battleships in the uh, direct escort of the of the convoy uh, that uh, delivers other tons of thousand, several tons of supplies uh, in January, which are very, very needed by Rommel. As, as you can see, this is the graph for the monthly supplies for 1942, and you see that uh, 19, uh, sorry, January and February are all 100% of the stuff uh, arrives on the in the Libyan ports. So, just to jump into it, a bit of context, yeah. Julio, um, just to connect this with the Battle of the Atlantic, January 42 is the, is the beginning of the the, the so-called second happy time for German U-boat crews, isn't it? So the the first one had been in early in 1940s. So this, this is a really bad time for the Royal Navy and the Allies because th this has been a, a bad period in the Mediterranean and they're just entering a bad period in the Atlantic when the U-boats, are. you say, you don't understand these terms, folks, the, the, the two happy times, first happy time, second happy time is the, kind of the, the uh, collective words we now use to describe the two periods where German U-boats were most effective against the, mm -hmm. the shipping. So this is, this is a bleak time. Uh, and I guess if we go to the Southern Hemisphere, Singapore yeah. has just fallen as well. So, uh, so yeah, and they have, and uh, the Royal Navy has lost the Prince of Wales and yeah. uh, Repulse, I think. So the force they, that was sent to to defend Singapore. So there, there are tremendous losses in this period. It's a, it's a really bad, bleak time. And again, you know, the, the people who've been following me for some time over the last couple of years, I've become really, really fascinated by 1942. I'm an unashamed 1944 guy because I live in Normandy. But I've <laughs> begun to realize that 1942 is becoming my quote unquote quote favorite year of the world war in terms of <laughs> understanding the complexity and how how knife edge the situation was through that year yeah yeah absolutely uh, i would say also 1941 sometimes is uh, overlooked i mean you have barbarossa so barbarossa gets most of the attention at, well stuff happening in the mediterranean and north africa 
get less uh, attention. But anyway, uh, so the Italians are, have, have been successful in pushing through the convoy. Then they uh, send another convoy in January. So let's say they recover from the convoy crisis uh, from October, November 1941. And then again, this is reflected by the fact that Rommel is um, able to launch his uh, counterattacks and basically vanify the uh, results of Operation Crusader. What happens then is uh, the British try again to... Uh, uh, so, sorry, we, we come to the context of February, March 1942. So again, as I mentioned, we have the counterattack in Libya, uh, the capital ship losses that we mentioned, and Malta is in a dire state because uh, the, Luft the Luftwaffe is back in the theater and it's bombing hard Malta. Uh, Force K and Force B are no more. So the island is uh, going through another of its bleak times and uh, they are in desperate need of supplies. Uh, the Royal Navy launches um, a um, resupply operation in February that it's uh, completely annihilated by the Luftwaffe and no ship reach, no ship, mm, not a single ship reach, uh, reaches Malta. Mm. Uh, so this forces the, um, the Royal Navy to put in motion another uh, operation with pu putting together all the ships they have available, which at this point in time are only light cruisers and destroyer and destroyers. And we come to Operation MG1, which is the uh, which is led by Admiral uh, Rear Admiral, I think, uh, Philip Vian, which uh, sails from Alexandria with his uh, five light cruisers, 18 destroyers, and his uh, five merchant ships, including the the Breconshire, the, the veteran of the Malta resupply combos. This time, uh, there is no, uh, let's say, um, random encounter. The, um, the Italians know that uh, Malta is in dire condition and uh, um, they want to stop this from happening. They, they want to stop the, re resupply, the British resupply operation from happening. And uh, Again, the admiral. Uh, uh, sorry, I wanted to show you this. Um, yeah. So since we we love maps, yeah, we <laughs> I put it. I put another map. So basically, you see the uh, the convoy approaching from the east, and uh, the encounter at sea uh, again in almost in the same area where the first uh, battle of Sirte took place. Uh, we have to mentioned that uh, this clash uh, occurred in a in a very very terrible very terrible condition the the sea was extremely rough the wind was blowing very hard uh, and these are things that you have to consider when you are fighting a naval battle because if the, if the sea is very rough it's harder for you to for your range finders to to direct the the fire of your guns and then the, the the ship itself is is shaken by the movement uh, caused by the waves and so your your fire is not very accurate loses accuracy and also the range finders are have a hard ha harder time in uh, identifying the targets because the visibility is also poor so a lot of uh, things have to be considered and it's, I, I put this uh, image of this uh, British destroyer uh, pushing through this uh, very rough sea and uh, also uh, here, these are two pictures of uh, the battleship Littorio. That also from this picture, we can see that the, the, the sea was not very well mm. <laughs> during this engagement. And uh, on the top right, Admiral Yakino. So they, um, what happens is that uh, the, the Italian, the Italian fleet intercepts the the British, the British formation, and. This graph shows this map shows the best the, the tactical um, development of the action. You you see the the three main uh, lines uh, from uh, from bottom to uh, from from down to to up up down. Bottom sorry, top, bottom, top, <laughs> yeah, top, yeah, bottom top, yeah, bottom top. So the you have the bottom one is the uh, the convoy with its close escort, which of course. Uh, um, takes um, a southern route in order to uh, uh, increase the distance 
between them and the Italian uh, forces. And then you have the, the other escort, uh, which is the line in, the, in between, that basically is faced with a hard task. They have to defend the convoy from uh, an overwhelming uh, Italian fleet because there are uh, two heavy cruisers, there is one battleship and 10 destroyers. They don't have battleships, they don't have heavy cruisers, they only have uh, light cruisers and uh, destroyers. They have more... Uh, uh, destroys. Uh, we have to we have to say. So what the British do? It's basically creating this huge and long smoke screen to to hide uh, themselves and the convoy from the from the Italian ships. And the engagement uh, uh, starts with the Italian cruisers coming on a perpendicular route to the to the convoy. They attack the escort, uh, they fire some shots, then they reverse course to reunite with the with the battleship and then they join together in attacking the uh, the British formation. Again the the sea the weather conditions are very bad. The the wind is blowing against the Italians so this complicates further the, the situation. Um, and they are basically sailing towards this uh, huge smoke screen. So Admiral Yakino at this point had two choices. He could uh, sail uh, west in order to put himself between Malta and the, the convoy, or he could uh, sail east to put himself at the back of the convoy and then eventually disrupt the convoy from there. Uh, he made the, the choice of uh, sailing west in order to put him between the convoy and Malta and, in a way, delay the, the approach of the convoy to Malta. After, after the war, he, some historians have criticized this decision, claiming that he, if he would have sailed to the east, he could have disrupted more easily the, the convoy. But uh, these considerations, I think, have to be... Uh, yeah, have to be considered, but at the same time, you have to put yourself in the situation that the commander has uh, finds himself in the in the operation. He has to take a decision uh, in the in a short uh, time frame. He has uh, not the he has a limited amount of information compared to us today. So it's uh, I'm very cautious in uh, saying he did wrong. He did mm. this was the uh, worst option or or not. Uh, we have, in, in a way, to, to, to judge uh, his conduct, I think we have to, to see the, the result uh, of the operation. And the result is that the Italians uh, fire at, uh, at this huge smoke screen. Uh, there are some um, this British destroyers that appear at some point in the, in the gaps between the, the, the smoke clouds. Um, the Italian fire a lot of uh, shots, like also the, uh, the Littorio fires, I think, all almost 200 shots against the British. And um, no, there, there are no direct hits uh, on the British ships, but uh, a lot of near misses that cause uh, a lot of uh, damages uh, on, the, on the British destroyers and uh, light cruisers. And uh, the British destroyers at, at, from time to time uh, is, uh, exit from the smoke screen and try to launch torpedo attacks in order to re to uh, force the Italians to uh, change course and distance themselves uh, from the convoy. So it's a very chaotic and uh, messy thing, this battle. But as you can see from the, uh, from the routes uh, depicted here and better on the general map that uh, we saw here, what, what Yakino has achieved is pushing the, the convoy down to the south and eventually delay the the march uh, to Malta. When night falls, uh, Admiral Aquino withdraws because uh, he cannot uh, fight uh, the Royal Navy at night, uh, uh, and then he mm, he sails back towards Taranto. He has achieved this. He has delayed the march of the convoy to Malta, exposing uh, the convoy uh, on the next day to air attacks. In fact, the during the, the actual battle, the, the Italians managed to, to, to damage some warships, but no uh, merchant ships are, are hit. The, on the, the next day, the Luftwaffe and the Italian Air Force attack 
severely attacked the uh, the uh, the British convoy, and uh, almost all the uh, merchant ships are hit or sunk. Uh, this is the the Pampas, uh, the merchant ship Pampas that was sunk in the in, Ma in the Grand Harbour. Here, these are other. Uh, I think impressive image of this uh, other merchant uh, hit uh, inside uh, the harbor, and and also the Breconshire is lost. Uh, it's it's lost uh, like eight miles uh, from the from Malta, and they they try to to tow her to the port, but uh, the operation is unsuccessful, and the ship is eventually lost. So the result is that of the twenty four thousand tons of supplies that uh, the convoy was. Uh, tra transporting to Malta, only 4,500 4, are delivered to, to the island. And uh, also in the, the day after the battle and the other days, the Luftwaffe hits hard the, the, um, the, the merchants and also the destroyers. There is another destroyer lost uh, in the next days because of these this, uh, aerial attacks. And jump a step back, I wanted to so, so this is the um, HMS Penelope, who was, was part of the uh, escort of the convoy, and you you can see the the these are the damages caused by the near near misses of the of the Littorio. So this you can you have, you have to imagine these uh, fifteen inch uh, projectiles exploding very near and releasing a huge amount of splinters that eventually uh, damage or also cause some. Uh, wounded or killed people on board the ships and here again there were pictures taken from italian and british ships showing some bits of the battle so that you see the smoke screen you see the rough sea and uh, you have a partial glimpse of uh, how the situation uh, uh, was in reality uh, and then here the, um, the hms havoc that was a hit in the days uh, it was Ma um, damage during the the battle and then later by the aerial attacks and then eventually was grounded uh, near the Tunisian coast. So this uh, brings us to the the let's say the, the the discussion who won this uh, this engagement because if, in general uh, Admiral Vian is credited to have defended the convoy. Uh, against uh, an overwhelming enemy force. And yeah, in doing this, he was successful. Uh, let's say the, web, the his mission uh, and his mission, let's say, was to defend the convoy. He had a consistent escort to do so, although not having battleships and heavy cruisers. He was perhaps helped by the, the weather conditions. Uh, the Italians could not... Uh, uh, penetrate the smoke screen because this would have exposed them to uh, torpedo attacks from the destroyers. So he was successful in, in this. But again, Yakino was not successful in a way to, to destroy the convoy. But in the situation he, he found himself, he managed to, to, to get a strategic result because he delayed the march of the convoy, allowing for aerial attacks uh, the next day. So this is uh, the, the let's say the the discussion that we need to have in evaluating this uh, this battle because again these battles are short uh, there are no uh, tactical results in terms of ship lost uh, major ships lost etc but they have to be put in context of the Mediterranean campaign before we mentioned that uh, the the convoy escorted by the Italians during the uh, the first battle of Sirte was instrumental for Rommel to, to launch his counterattacks. If we look at this, um, so the, the second battle of Sirte, the, the supplies that did not arrive uh, in, in Malta during this occasion basically forced the, the Royal Navy to put in motion more ambitious operations to, to resupply Malta. In fact, uh, in June, there will be the two twin operation, Operation Arpoon and Operation uh, Vigorous, that will try the same, resupplying Malta from east and west, deploying 
ma uh, massive naval assets that by by the summer uh, by the summer became more available to the Royal Navy. But again, uh, this meant a lot of um, forced concentration in the Mediterranean, mm. and we could say that Operation then Operation Vigorous and Operation Harpoon eventually fail again, and then there will be Operation Pedestal in August, yeah. which uh, again the the there will be. Uh, Battle cruiser, five, uh, four or four or five aircraft carriers, four or five aircraft carriers deployed to launch Operation Pedal. So a huge concentration of forces in the Mediterranean to resupply Malta. I mean, Operation Pedestal in the end managed to give relief to Malta. Um, some historians like Vincent Tuara they call this uh, operation again a failure because a lot of uh, ships were lost and the supplies um, delivered were not sufficient but by august 1942 the strategic situation had changed dramatically yeah. because the axis were not anymore in the position to threat malta they their romans advance in in, uh, in egypt had come to a halt so Although Operation Pedestal was it was a failure, let's say it was successful enough to uh, give breath and fresh air to Malta, let's say. Yeah, but Pedestal again, kind of brought that chapter to an end, the desperate chapter to an end, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And after then, despite as you say, it not being a complete success, and whether it's a failure or success, and that's what I find fascinating about this whole discussion is that where how do you define these it's because it's not it's not you can't really look at each individual convoy yeah. you have to look at the whole context of, of yeah, the pendulum everything. effect of sort of supplies and logistics in the whole mediterranean really yeah everything is relative to, to the context absolutely so the the first sirte is a clash of 10 minutes so uh, irrelevant for uh, naval standards because yeah you 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 want to see uh, long uh, fire exchanges ships sunk but no it's not relevant on that aspect but it's extremely relevant for the for the strategic context and then again the uh, uh, the second circuit is also relevant because uh, the the failure of that convoy implies that Malta needs uh, new resupply operations escorted by a much more consistent forces that, again, if they are deployed in the Mediterranean, they are not deployed uh, in the Atlantic or uh, in, the, in the Far East against the Japanese, which by the time are having their happy period because they are ravaging uh, all over the, the, the Pacific and uh, Southeast Asia. So everything is has to be put in context. And uh, another thing that I think we mentioned last year with Drak and Alexander Clark, uh, we can also uh, connect this to the Alexandra raid. So we know that um, the, frog, the Italian frogman raid in Alexandria uh, sunk in harbor two battleships. And it's December 1941. By March 1942, I... Mm, I mean, it was plausible that these two battleships could have been used in the March operation to resupply Malta. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Admiral Aquino by that time had only the Littorio uh, as a functional, uh, an op operational battleship and a bunch of like uh, heavy cruises. So facing uh, two battleships with with just one battleship was absolutely not in the uh it did not fall in his rule of uh rule of engagement because yeah. the, the Italian Navy, since they relied on a limited number of ships that they could not uh um substitute uh they had to in, they they had the uh the order was to engage the British on a from a superiority point of view so they right. if you have at least two two versus one but one one versus one it's already mm, you have to see then on the cruiser uh, the cruiser forces uh, so i guess that if the valiant and the queen elizabeth were present during that uh, during that escort mission uh, yakino would have not uh, engaged battle so the convoy possibly would have uh, reached Malta, delivered the supplies in time. And then maybe 
Operation Vigorous and Harpoon would have been uh, there was no need in eventually yeah. for them, and so these naval forces would have uh, diverted to other theaters. This would have spared uh, lots of losses in terms of ships and men. So everything is connected in a way. You know? so that, that's fascinating about the Mediterranean campaign. Well, exactly. I mean, I was going to make the point that if we if we compare it to the Pacific. Rarely in the Pacific did we fight the same battle twice. I mean, the 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 camp the camp the campaign was moving across the 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 the, the, the ocean. So you know, Midway, Coral Sea, then later on, Truk, and they don't happen in the same place. The Mediterranean allows the historian to look at almost a repetition of the same things because the convoys continue. So you can compare the, these two battles are interesting but as you said there are these other convoys in march these other convoys even as far as as you said august and pedestal you can look mm. at them and you can make these comparisons okay so in this one they use battleships this one they use carry this one was small this one was larger mm. and you've got some information some data i suppose to, to draw some conclusions because of this repetition isn't quite the right word because they're not repeated but they're the each one that passes is influencing influencing how the next one will be planned and exactly. from, from both sides point of view so there's yeah it's just interesting is what i'm saying basically yeah yeah no the the, the attrition because uh, ships lost in one operation affects the, Affect the next, next operation and this is especially true for the italians that do not have a huge amount of ships that they have to carefully use and deploy and this is also uh, extremely true for the merchant ships uh, because uh, this is a point that also Richard Hammond made. Although the, the Italian Navy was uh, able to de de deliver the supplies to North Africa on a relatively, relatively high rate, the attrition caused by the Mediterranean campaign on the merchant ships was unsustainable in the long run. In fact, yeah. uh, in September, by September 1942, uh, the situation has reached this point in which there are not not any more uh, fast merchant ships available, so the the, the numbers are um, reducing at a very uh, dangerous rate. Um, and in fact, as we will see, an increased usage of warships to carry um, fuel personnel. This would be especially true for Tunisia. The convoys that the Regia Marina will run to resupply the, um, the Axis forces in Tunisia will heavily rely on transport made on destroyers. So you have these images of small Italian destroyers packed with uh, German and Italian soldiers or fuel, um, fuel barrels, these mm. kind of things. Because the, the merchant ships available were not any more sufficient. But this is again, um, gets us to the argument that the Axis eventually could not face the, uh, they could not sustain the attrition overall as the Allies could. So yeah. This is this is true for the Italian Navy, but this is true for the, for the, for the, the German, Axis general. Uh, yeah. And that, yeah, yeah you, for everybody. You made that point there about the, you could have, the Regia Marina could have a, a a victory, quote unquote, but it's not really a victory because, as you say, it's not sustainable. Which is why, when we, when we look at the pedestal, which we've covered a little bit on before, and James Hans thought about that, is as you say that it, not enough supplies get to Malta with pedestal, but it's the beginning enough. of a chapter where the Allies now have more of everything. There are more yeah. merchant ships being produced. Liberty, I know the Liberty ships don't come into Medellin the same way, but the, there's a production happening in the USA. There's yeah. things happening behind the scenes where the, the, the Allies are never going to be as low again as they were no. before then. Whereas there's a point with the Axis, and particularly the Italian side of things, where they've absolutely peaked. That they're, they're, There's no way they can they can reach the, the heights they had reached in in december 41 spring 42 so that's the Absolutely. that's where you've got to look at these individual actions on this sort of sweeping chart and timeline of where it's sitting and where the mm -hmm. where the general trend is going i suppose yeah. is, is where it's more interesting yeah le again let's say we could say yeah the regio marina was successful after uh, until a certain point uh, although the the month the crisis in november uh, but again you could also make the point that not enough 
uh, staff was uh, dispatched to North Africa because there were at some points other um, needs. I mean, the, Mussolini had the brilliant idea to disperse uh, or overstretch his already tiny forces in uh, in Greece, in Russia also, because we have to remember that when um, in June, in July, June and July 1941, when Rommel is on the offensive in, in North Africa, uh, Mussolini sends an army corps to, to Russia with uh, trucks, uh, guns, fuel, and so on. And uh, he does the same thing in 1942. Uh, the first, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, yeah, in the first half of 1942, he, he increases the, this army corps in Russia to an army, to, the, to an army size. So sending again uh, anti-tank guns, artillery, troops, fuel, and trucks. And this, from the Italian point of view, it's, it's a stupid uh, uh, dispersion of uh, the limited forces and assets that they have, because he he did this on uh, just out of political reason, not not understanding that uh, Italy had, from his perspective, had to fight in the Mediterranean and in North Africa. Then again, the Regio Marina delivered the stuff, but at certain point it was powerless against uh, the Force K, the Force B, the um, the radar equipped uh, reconnaissance that could guide uh, British submarines and British torpedo bombers on the on the convoys. And then again, the attritional war that could not be sustained by any of the Axis powers, especially especially the Italians. And for instance, the we mentioned the the battleship, how the Italians at, in December 1941, they were desperate and they decided to, to send all the battleships available to uh, protect these convoys. In parenthesis, contrary to the myth that after Taranto, the, the Italian Navy never exited the port. Uh, mm. uh, so <laughs> this is a clear example that they were committed uh, to, to use the, their battleships. But again, then they use again the battleships to try to interdict uh, the convoys to Malta, especially in, uh, in, the, in the second Sirte and also in Harpoon and Vigorous. But then in, in pedestal, they don't deploy the battleships because they don't have enough fuel. The, I, I, will, I will soon publish some data on the on the fuel availability, uh, the fuel available to the Regia Marina. And basically, in summer 1942, the three littorio class battleships that were operational in, in summer 1942, excellent ships, they were sitting ducks because there was no fuel. And uh, I read that uh, in this uh, publication that uh, on, on, the, um, on the Italian uh, fuel supply, that when the Italy signed the armistice you know, with, the, with the Allies, and then the, the Navy... Uh, left uh, La Spezia and sailed to Malta. Uh, in between, there is the loss of the Roma sunk by the, the Germans and so on. But then the Navy is able to set sail in force and reach Malta because back in from November 1942 and March 1943, uh, they were able to pump out uh, the fuel from the French Navy scuttled in Toulon. So, you know, the, the, after the, the Germans decided to occupy Vichy France, the French fleet scuttled in, itself in Toulon. The Germans were able to pump out the fuel from the most of the sunken ships, and they gave this fuel to the Italians because they, they knew that, that the Italians had no more uh, fuel for their warships. And eventually this, this fuel was used by the, the Italians to set sail and uh, reach Malta and, uh, and join the Allies eventually. So it's a funny thing. <laughs> Wow. Well, we've, we've, I've just asked people on the sidebar a few questions to finish. Yeah, 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 please. You may have answered some of these in the program with Drac and Alex on, on, on the other shows, but we'll do them anyway. So from um, from Brad on, on this day in Canadian military history, did the Italian Navy work much with the Royal Navy in the First World War? And if they did, was there an influence on tactics? In World War One, okay. Yes, they worked together a lot because in World War I... Um, the main theater of operation for the Italians was the Adriatic Sea. They ba they basically had to uh, impede the Austro-Hungarian fleet to support the land operations, uh, and that it, that they were extremely successful using these small uh, torpedo boats, the um, 
motor torpedo boats, tiny um, 15 tons vessels that uh, posed a threat to the big uh, capital ships. In fact, the famous uh, sinking of the Zen East one, the, the host Hungarian battleship, uh, was um, was carried out by using these tiny tiny vessels. Uh, another part of the of the story, which is not uh, told enough, it's the um, the barrage that the the French, the British, and the Italians created in the Otranto Strait. So the Otranto Strait is this uh, sea zone between uh, Italy and Albania. Basically, it guards the uh, entry uh, from the Adriatic into the Mediterranean. And there, the the Italians, the Brit, the Italians, the British, and the French, they created this barrage, composed by a sur- continuous patrol of uh, destroyers, but also of uh, mines. And at some point, they also created these uh, nets of, um, uh, let's see, no, this n- steel uh, torpedo nets, kind of that were meant to trap the submarines passing through. They were not meant to sunk the submarines, but uh, a submarine running into this uh, net would have signaled its presence and then it would have been attacked. So the the Royal Navy helped a lot the the Italians in anti-submarine warfare in the the First World War and also conducting some uh, joint fleet operations in the southern Adriatic uh, I'm talking about light cruisers and destroyers level operations because no battleships were used in the, in that theater. Okay. Um, we've had a, the question about fuel, and I think you've already answered that with the talk about the French fuel and what have you. But um, uh, this is more of a, a general one, but it's from Ian Carr. Would the Italians have been better advised to construct more smaller warships than the modern battleships and half-finished carriers? <laughs> Good question. Uh, so, uh, yes and no, because the, for instance, the problem of the es- the escorts, it's uh, it's extremely relevant. Uh, the Italians entered World War II with basically no anti-submarine uh, capabilities, anti-submarine warfare capabilities. What do I, I mean? They relied on hydrophones and optical sightings. So if they sighted the periscope of a submarine or the bubbles caused by a torpedo launch, they knew that there was a submarine there and they would have tucked in this area. Then they had hydrophones, but hydrophones are, let's say, the, the, called the passive sonar. So they listen to the rumors uh, happening under the surface. The problem is the hydrophone is not very effective because you also hear the rumor of the en- your engine, the engine of your warship. So to make it work, you have to uh, navigate at very low speed, like four knots, which is not a great idea. Mm. And they didn't have ASDIC, they didn't have sonar. Uh, they got it by the end of 1941, but still they got some uh, German built sonar and for quite some time, there was there were uh, German uh, sailors operating sonar on Italian ships, and once they they employed the sonar, the anti-submarine capabilities increased a lot, and they were also much more effective. And but of uh, again, the, there were not enough uh, sonar, there were not enough escort ships to to cover all all the needs. Let's say. Um, regarding the escort vessel, yes, the fact that in the 1930s they devoted a lot of uh, uh, efforts in building the, the new battleships and also rebuilding the old um, World War One era dreadnoughts, this caused a diversion of forces. Uh, they still built destroyers, they still built torpedo boats, but uh, they didn't have enough destroyers and torpedo boats to uh, to cover their needs because this is also something that deals with their strategic overview. From 1936-37, they knew that uh, they probably would have faced the Royal Navy and the Marine Nationale together, and they knew that against these two powerful enemies, they had no chances to uh, resupply Libya. They could have, optimistically, they could have conducted a, like a naval guerrilla with torpedo boats, destroyers, and so on, and used the battleship as a fleeting being, essentially. Um, 
And the idea was that Libya had to endure it in a, with its own forces. They probably would have shipped consistent supplies to Libya before the outbreak of this eventual war. And then Libya would have crossed the fingers and tried to resist. So this was the, this was the idea. <laughs> uh, and again, not the, the problem of protecting convoys, escorting convoys came only at the very, very late. And uh, yeah, during wartime, they they shifted the, the production of warships entirely on submarines, uh, destroyers, and uh, torpedo boats. But you, the the guy who made the comment is, is right. If, for instance, they didn't uh, waste their resources in uh, modernizing the old dreadnoughts, they could have spared these resources to build more destroyers or more uh, torpedo boats. But, but then I guess we could look at every participant nation and say they should have built more of this and less of that that, that could apply to everything from absolutely true, true. to small arms that it's easy after the events so we we should have not made so many of them because we didn't end up using them that's that's hindsight yeah we'll yeah the last question there and it's 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 another general one really um how much of the officer and nco corps was available from the first world war and was there any type of political purge of the military by the fascists so like a Stalinist kind of purging? Absolutely no purges. Uh, so the Italian Navy is uh, considered to be the most, the among the three armed forces, the, the one much more loyal to the king, mm -hmm. while the Air Force was seen as the, let's say, the more fascist army branch because it was uh, built in the, in the 20s after Mussolini raised to power. But also on that, there are many points to make so the all the admirals that uh, saw service in world war ii had experience in the in the first world war and some of them also in the uh, italian turkish war so they had experience uh, in that regard the thing is the adriatic campaign in the first world war influ let's say has had a kind of negative influence on the on the Italian thinking uh, uh, translated to what happened in World War II, because in for instance the let's take submarine warfare in the Great War the Italians deployed some submarines in uh, before the um, the Adriatic uh, bases of the Austro-Hungarian fleets, so they had a limited seasons to guard. They they knew that the bases were there. They basically waiting for the Austro-Hungarians to, to, to leave their bases and ambush them in specific seasons. And this idea was detrimental to what they uh, developed as a submarine doctrine, let's say, because they, they took this and they um, used it also for the Mediterranean in the in World War II. So they did not develop any kind of uh, wolf pack tactics, uh, cooperation between submarines. No, nothing, uh, nothing that, uh, about that. Nothing like that. Sorry. Uh, because of this uh, experience in the Great War, and also because perhaps they did not observe, uh, did did not uh, learn enough from the other navies experience but again for us today with internet so on it's so much easy to learn and uh, read stuff back then back then it was it was not the case and uh, also if we compare the operations of the italian submarines that um, took place in the atlantic because for those who don't know the italians participated in the battle of the atlantic the the submarines employed there had similar problems since they had no experience or doctrine uh, for attacking convoys, uh, convoys crossing huge uh, seasons and uh, effectively hunting down convoys, not sitting in a, in a small area and waiting for a ship to come by. So this also um, caused problems on a tactical level. And, and then they, they learned from the Germans how to conduct uh, submarine warfare in the Atlantic. Uh, so let's say... The, the the Great War experience had some effects uh, on the Italian Navy that were not particularly happy for how World War II uh, evolved. 
Well, this is brilliant stuff, Julio. And uh, people have been saying in the comments there, it's, they, they love you. Thank you. <laughs> and it's just that we, the constant reminder, we've talked about it before. You mentioned Richard Hammond. Of course, he did a show with me and he may be doing something with you. Richard, it has, you know, he can read Italian sources. He has used Italian historians and other historians from around the Mediterranean. But, it, you know, we've said it before. Um, we just, we need to keep on the keep these dialogues. We need to keep asking Italian historians what they think, and 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 we've had you know Turkish historians on our channel and and what have you. And 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 for that for those who are watching who are like myself British, again I'm confessing that a lot of the stuff I read when I was younger was by British authors and by British admirals at that, and it was a very uniquely British perspective. And to to fully understand the Mediterranean, we have to understand. The perspectives of everybody who was there, including even that the neutral nations, the neutral using that in its very mm. various terms there, but the the Turkish point of view, the Spanish point of view, the North African point of view, and and you know we've done shows about the Australians, the Mediterranean, and the, the it's it's an endlessly complex subject, but it also has needs to be looked at from more than one point of view, and I think that's what we'll leave you on today. So we will we will bring you back and 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 do something again in the future i'll just remind people what we've got coming up and i'll come back and say goodbye in a second so folks i'm off this weekend and indeed i don't have anything scheduled for monday yet i may change that and do something for monday it's possible but the next officially scheduled show is tuesday next week on and the, the next few days is a random series of shows we've got m murderers in the british forces buried in brookwood we've got third part of our U.S. crime series of James Fennell on is talking about Operation Varsity, the crossing of the Vine, uh, Rhine, the Vine, the Rhine. I'm working on a show to commemorate, uh, I haven't scheduled yet, the 80th anniversary of the first uh, con uh, transport of Jewish prisoners to Auschwitz. I'm working on that whole, that, that's that's in, in process. So a whole variety of shows coming up. Again, I remind you that the links to uh, the Italian Military Archives YouTube channel, Julio's channel is in the description below and his work he does for Italian Military Archives and various websites and all and, and other resources. So go and check those out. But right now I'm going to bring him back in to say goodbye, basically. So um, thank you very much for putting this out at, at short notice. It's most appreciated and it just reminds us that how much I want to know more about the Mediterranean. <laughs> so, brilliant. Thanks, thanks a lot. And, a and have a good weekend. And, yeah, um, you too. Brilliant. Bye, okay, cheers, everybody. This is Paul Willard from World War II TV saying I'll see you all again next week. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.